Do you think that by knowing Oleg's secret, I could uh, run away and feel safe anywhere? This is Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you follow us in your podcast app or join our emailing list at coldwarconversations.com. The second part of Svetlana's story starts shortly after her arrival in West Germany with her husband Oleg, who is the chief editor of the Russian service of Radio Liberty, a CIA finance station beaming Western propaganda into the Soviet Union. To Svetlana's horror, Oleg reveals that he has been working for the KGB for 14 years. Svetlana is now trapped. She's in a quandary. Should she betray the man she loves and risk the wrath of the KGB, or should she stay loyal to her husband? Loyalty wins out and she is invited by the Americans to teach Russian to intelligence officers and later becomes assistant to the commander of the US Army Intelligence Institute in Munich. However, in 1986, Oleg disappears and leaves Svetlana on her own in West Germany. At a press conference in Moscow, he reveals his espionage and suspicion falls on Svetlana. The battle to preserve Cold War history is ongoing and your support can provide me with the ammunition to continue to keep this podcast on the air. Via a simple monthly donation, you'll become one of our community and get a sought-after Cold War Conversations drinks coaster as a thank you and you'll bask in the warm glow of knowing that you're helping to preserve Cold War history. Hello, I'm Craig Donald from Aberdeen and I support Cold War Conversations with a monthly donation because it marries interesting historical content with fantastic storytelling. Ian is a great gift as an interviewer. He knows his subject so that the conversations are meaningful, but he also allows guests to tell their own story. Cold War Conversations is part of my weekly routine and I would urge you to make it part of yours. Just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. I'm delighted to welcome Svetlana to our Cold War conversation. How did he tell you that he was working for the KGB? Can you describe the moment? Yeah, the moment was about two weeks after I came, I joined him in Munich, which was probably, it was around June, June 78. So uh, he came back from work, from Radio Liberty, and he said that he wanted to speak to me. And surprisingly, he didn't take me for a walk. He was a lazy person. So he just we just went to the balcony of our flat. And there he, said, he showed me a, a map, a world map. And he asked me, what do you think? You know, in a hush-hush, low voice, he said, well, who do you think I'm working for? And of course, I pointed out to, to, to America, like to the, to the West, and he said, no, he pointed with his finger. He showed on the map and he said, I'm working for the KGB. What was your reaction to that? Just, just like right now, I, I'm speechless. I, I, I got speech, speech you know, I, I, I was in a shock. The next morning, I didn't talk to him. The next morning, I got into a tram. I was when he went to work, and I was traveling in a tram back and forth, back and forth, and not knowing where to go. And then in the evening, I, I you know, I had somewhere to sleep, so I came late, back home late, uh, after he was already asleep, just to go to bed. We didn't speak for two weeks or so for a fortnight because I just couldn't consume. I just couldn't consume it. Um, you know, obviously, with the background that I had and the life that I enjoyed, also in London, knowing like the creme de la creme of the Soviet dissident movement, being always kind of on the top of the events. And I managed my life that it will continue in, in, in Munich, my husband being uh, uh, head of the Russian service, I will be able to do even more for these people who don't work for the radio, for the famous, uh, you know, dissidents, 
because we would do programs and this would be all broadcasted to the Soviet Union. So I, I, I imagined that I would use my influence even to do more in this direction. And here you go. Against what your husband was working for? Absolutely. It was completely, it was something completely different from something that I couldn't imagine in my worst dreams. Was Oleg with the KGB right from the start or did they recruit him once he arrived in Germany? Uh, I'll try again. Look, he ran away. He escaped uh, from, he defected from a wash, warship uh, during um, active service, military service in the Navy. Uh, for that, he was uh, sentenced, um, uh, not, he would have been sentenced uh, to death had a uh, military prosecutor found him. And there was a note in the KGB lookbook to look for the sailor to look for him so they after they were the russians were after him thinking how to bring him uh, back to russia and to to kill him basically to murder him to kill him he says that this was his cover uh, to make his um, legend like his agent's leg legend stronger but maybe this is the truth. Now when he is dead, and now when, uh, you know, after they can't uh, punish him anymore, maybe, uh, maybe I should say that this is the truth. But in his book, uh, he, in his memoirs that he published in the United States in 19... Uh, 93, he says that uh, this was just a disguise uh, to, to uh, disguise and a legend. In his book, he says that he's, he was recruited in, in to work for KGB uh, before his escape. And wh which one do you think it is? Or do you not know? <laughs> I will just illustrate it a little bit. Last week, I had an interview on the state uh, Zvezda TV uh, about our case. And Mr. Nichiparenko, who is a colonel, a retired colonel in his 90s, still living in Moscow, and who, uh, according to the book, uh, to Oleg's book, uh, was the officer that recruited him in Moscow before he, Oleg's escape. So he was invited to this program and he didn't come because he doesn't want to confirm anything that Oleg writes in his book. So this is how I will illustrate the situation. Yeah, we draw our uh, own conclusions. Absolutely. Did you get the impression Oleg liked being a spy? Definitely. Definitely. He felt like a Superman, like a James Bond over the others. He was, uh, he felt that he could manipulate people. He could manipulate people's fa uh, future and their face. Uh, definitely. He completely, he fit into the job perfectly, I would say. And how did, your relationship work after that that revelation did you still love him even after that well the thing is that i loved him not vice versa so now i love this kgb man but i loved the man i didn't love uh, like the officer in him i loved the man and i learned to live with it Also, there was no place I could go back to. Starting all over from scratch, where I, it's not an excuse, but I'm just saying, what would you do in my situation? 
Also, once you mentioned Markov, do you think uh, that by knowing his uh, uh, Oleg's secret, uh, I could uh, run away and feel safe anywhere? In fact, even later, Oleg said that often he was driven by um, uh, by scare because Markov was not the only person in the West that was assassinated by uh, Eastern uh, Europe's intelligence services. So <laughs> it's uh, you have to look at the situation from many sides. Of course, I guess if I was born in in the United States, where uh, you you if something like this happens to you, not just in the United States, but if I was a, even a born British or born American citizen, and I would have more choice and more options, but I was hanging uh, in the air without. Uh, without real citizenship, without work, without um, accommodation, you know, it was not like going out and finding a job. Ba basically, I I was in ruins. If I left him, I would have been in ruins, and I was afraid that I knew too much, that I wouldn't get away with it so easily. As was he. All of us, uh, we not you. You can't live with uh, uh, feeling uh, danger every day. You get used to it. But uh, once in a while, it crops your mind that you know you know too much. If even if you don't do too much, but you know too much. How did he communicate? with the KGB? He would go every several months to Austria. He would go to Austria to meet his leading officers there. And this is why also one of the reasons why he told me, because he didn't want me to feel that he, is, uh, he has a lover or some you know, girlfriend. And also he didn't want me to start my own investigation had I become suspe suspicious where he's going every several months for a couple of days. So this is, was also one, one of the considerations why he told me. And here's uh, the equipment that he had at home. He had his spies equipment. I mean, I would have found out sooner or later. What did he have? Did he have radio equipment or equipment to copy documents, that sort of thing? Electronic equipment uh, uh, to receive uh, instructions via radio from Moscow, deciphering tools, and of course, you know, photographing tools. Also, his numismatic uh, affection, his affection for stamps and uh, coins was not so simple because he could hide quite a lot in a coin, in a container, in a coin. You know, <laughs> you call <laughs> the, the, the full uh, set of tools. And what, what sort of information was he passing that would be of interest to the KGB? After I learned about what, what he did and after he took me with him on one of his meetings, uh, so I was fully involved. Uh, in, in Physically, I was fully involved. He, he needed a driver to take him to Austria because he didn't drive a car. But I never really asked him or was interested to know exactly uh, what information he is passing on uh, to the Russians. He used to bring documents home and he used to photograph them, but I didn't look at it. I didn't ask him. It was not like it was not like he was sharing with me all these details. Maybe trying to protect you from some of it anyway. Maybe. Or maybe feeling that uh, uh, he was 14 years older, like feeling he's 
like uh, pr protecting and protective and fe feeling more um, not important but uh, feeling that he is the mature person you know that is in control the m more dominant I didn't have to know everything 1981 you start working for the Americans can you just describe what that that job was and what you were doing the first job was very simple i was getting uh, kind of tired of being home all the time just being a housewife and uh, when the americans uh, advertised at the radio the, the 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 american army advertised this job at the radio it was uh, teaching Russian at the Russian Institute of Foreign Languages in Garmisch. So um, I, uh, I got, got a word about it. And I myself, I called uh, Garmisch and asked whether I, I could come for, for an interview, which they gladly agreed. And after I already passed uh, and was offered the job, uh, I... I well, I did tell Oleg that I will be going for the interview, but I guess he was hoping that I will not get the job. But it all happened very quickly. And then this is when he started expressing his big... Uh, uh, he was very negative. He was very much opposing it. He didn't want me to drive every day 100 miles or 90 miles. Uh, he even, you know, even in the summer... Uh, basically, he he was scared that I will have to undergo some kind of uh, security checks, which I will not stand, and we, he, he, it will it may blow up his work at the radio and at the KGB, you know, at the same time. So basically, he was very much against it, but. Um, he agreed after a while because it was only for six months. And he kind of, he hoped that once he didn't see any difficulties and nobody asked him, even, even I, I think he mentioned that his boss, the American boss at the radio said that, uh, like the Americans, they are glad that the whole family is helping them. He, he felt even maybe it's some kind of advantage for him that I'm working there for six months. And indeed, when I wanted to stay after six uh, after six months, when I wanted to continue, and when my position was not extended as a full-time teacher, I got a little bit sad. You know, um, I, I, I dealt with very high-quality people in Garmisch. Those were officers, of American officers that were preparing for their jobs in, in the Soviet Union, like um, attaches at the military attaches uh, at the embassies. In, in, in the Soviet Union, or even more clandestine work. So uh, I was uh, dealing with very high qualified people. I enjoyed my work. And of course, it was interesting also to the Russians, uh, what I did. But it was only six months. So really, uh, not, not much happened, I would, I would say. So uh, when my job was not, uh, ex employment was not extended, I was a little bit upset. But exactly at this time, I found out that I'm pregnant and I turned my mind to, you know, to motherhood, to expecting the baby. And I was not making any more plans. No, but, you know, like every, everything was taking its natural path. So uh, I, it, it, to my surprise, after, after Alexandra was born, our daughter was born, and when she was eight months old, uh, Oleg's um, leading officer, the American leading officer, the guy who brought him from, uh, from Libya to Frankfurt and then from Frankfurt to Munich, uh, Colonel Limbersky, Alex Limbersky. He was uh, patronizing our family and he, we, it, they were almost like uh, him and his family were like uh, family friends. We, so uh, he, he used to... to come over every two weeks at least uh, with, uh, with food and, and alcohol, cheap uh, alcohol from PX, American PX. 
So uh, he turned up routinely to bring some goodies for us. And then he says, uh, he turns over to me, Oleg was at work. And he turned over to me and he said, uh, I found a new job for you in Munich. But uh, this time it will not be teaching. You will be assistant to the commandant of the foreign language training center in Munich. It's a new, it's a new operation. You will not have to go, you know, to drive far every day. It's close, it's convenient. All you have to do is to sign the form. I didn't even have to, you know, to go anywhere. <laughs> I said, I'll have to speak to Oleg. I didn't, I, I wasn't happy because I said to Alex, uh, I'm breastfeeding. No, no, no problem. You, you know, the Americans, they turn, uh, return to work after two weeks after giving birth. So he said, no problem. You'll find a way. I was trying to make excuses to Alex. Also because I had first to, to speak to Oleg to, 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 to see what he says. But this time it was more difficult because I was not a teacher, but uh, not, not to be a teacher, but because I was to be the assistant of the intelligence uh, school, uh, I had to pass a uh, lie detector first. First of all, uh, it's not like uh, we talk to, to, with each other now and this is the next thing that you do. Before even considering going on a lie detector, there are many thoughts that, and, uh, and, and, um, and decisions that go through your head and considerations. It's step by step. I didn't know if I would do it. I didn't know how to do it. I'm, I was never a trained spy or a trained agent. I was not sure whether I wanted to do it. But we had a meeting in Austria where I took Oleg. And, you know, in the next days. And um, I spoke to the Russian officers about this option. Of course, <laughs> to Moscow, it was extremely interesting and attractive. So they tried to, to, to calm me down and they said that it would not be a problem, that I would pass, if I would not become nervous, I would pass without difficulty. They didn't really give me any instructions how to do it. They said, have a relax and drink a glass of milk before you go. I guess to a man, they would say, relax and uh, drink a glass of vodka. Anyhow, we returned back to Munich. And I kind of, what, what can happen? I will not pass it. That's the worst thing that will happen to me. I even didn't think of the questions that I may be asked. And those would be like, do you know any KGB? Do you work for the KGB? And so on and so forth. I didn't know ahead. I was young. Uh, and uh, this is what happened to me. And this is what I had to cope with during this lie, uh, lie detector examination. And the extreme, extreme psychological pressure that was exhausted on me. Uh, also, it's not like uh, looking for a job or, or applying for a job with an insurance company when you decide to work for, when you are being tested for working for the military intelligence. With uh, like, I was to become not top secret, but secret. What sort of questions did they ask? It's many years ago, but of course, they ask you very extensively, they question you very extensively about your possible connections with the KGB anywhere, in your family or maybe uh, during sports or uh, like uh, travels or very extensively. This, this is the main question to find out whether the person is linked to the Russian intelligence, to the enemy intelligence. I don't know how I did it. Oleg mentions in his, in his book that he passed the lie detector from the second attempt. In my case, it was maybe four or five hours and I was done. 
I don't know how I did it. Don't ask me. <laughs> um, were you actively passing information that you found in your job to the KGB? This is very interesting, Ian. Don't cut cut this out. Um, I'm going to talk in this interview only about general. General. I'm not going to talk about... Not because... Uh, uh, because I'm scared of anything in many years past. But uh, since um, intelligence became my second core, like my second life, I'm part of it. Most of my life is influenced by living with intelligence. Uh, this is, I'm, how do you say, code of... Um, code of honor. Exactly, code of honor. I will not talk, talk on details of my work before they are declassified. I can mention just, uh, you know, the general things that were done at, at, at this language intelligence center. Um, basically, those were, <laughs> were studies for two MOS uh, American officers, like with, uh, with the Russian um, speciality. Like it could be a it could be a pilot, but a pilot who would serve in 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 the in Eastern Europe, where he, his language knowledge would be an, an advantage. So um, basically, teaching uh, the officers at this language uh, uh, school the language, but also because I was part of the military command, and. Um, I was assistant colonel, uh, one of the chiefs of the McGraw base. We had uh, to do monthly reports about the movements of the arms and relocations and and whatever would happen, any activities that, like of general, like uh, what new equipment would be purchased and planned and uh, distribution, anything that we had to do with the activities of the not just of the McGraw base, but of the European Military Command. So I was involved with the reports on that. Thank you for um, for sharing that. Now, I think round about this point, Oleg is having some trouble with somebody he's tried to recruit. Yes. Uh, I don't know why he did it, because... According to my knowledge, he was, uh, by, by the Russians, they never asked him to recruit anybody. It was never his job, but he tried to, to do it. He, he tried to recruit a colleague at Radio Liberty, and this recruitment was unsuccessful. And this was a lady, she's by now, she's already dead. Uh, so I can a little bit talk about it a little bit more open. Um, she was a defector, she was not an emigrant, and she turned out to be a real defector. And uh, she uh, started blackmailing him that if he didn't give her work at the radio, like she was a um, freelance writer. So for each script, she would get paid. So she was putting more and more pressure on him to give her more work. She could uh, earn more and more. The reason why I'm saying this is, had Oleg lived to, till today, or had he not escaped, or maybe one of the reasons why he escaped, uh, one of the, not the reason, but one of the, because, because had there been a financial investigation at some point about the monies that are being paid, there could have been some, some kind of trouble for him or big trouble for him. Because just to give you an idea, she bought a house in Munich with these monies. So it went into the tens of tens of thousands of Deutsche Marks. And uh, he felt uh, under pressure and he wanted to take me out of, out of this pressure so that she wouldn't blackmail me. So this was the situation where he wanted to uh, to bring me out of um, 
danger, out of her reach. And also Oleg was drinking very badly by this time. He was not coping so well with his uh, double life. The nerves, you know, were getting back at him. So, yeah, And we had a little daughter. So these two things made us decide that we should live close to each other, but in two separate houses, like apartments. So I, I took another apartment in the same Arabella house and moved out with uh, with Alexandra. Yep. I'm being told by neighbors, I don't know this, but the neighbors told me that they often saw uh, Oleg at the porch of my apartment, uh, our apartment with my daughter, our daughter. He was sitting there with uh, flowers and crying. I didn't invent this, they tell me. Svetlana, I really appreciate you uh, sharing that that with us. Um, you, you hear of the pressure of being an agent in terms of living a, a double life, and this is almost further complicated because he's having to live this double life where it appears as though you are not in a relationship with him as well. Of course. And, he, and also expose you like... If investigation goes further, everything would blow up. And I'm innocent. I mean, okay, he's a grown-up man. But what did he bring me into and, and our daughter? So, of course, it was a lot of pressure for him. But he didn't tell me uh, all the details. This is why he cried. I mean, he didn't show me the emotions. He just explained to me that uh, in order... Uh, in order for me to be out of danger, he, he, you know, like we could uh, maybe separate for a while. And in fact, um, the day before he disappeared from Moscow, oh, he called me and and he asked me to to do his shirts, to to, to iron his shirts, which I didn't do a, every day, but. All of a sudden, and he asked me to cook something, you know, like his famous, uh, his favorite meal. So I think that he was thinking of uh, reuniting or he had something in his mind or maybe going away together. I don't know, because all of a sudden he asks me, you know, like. To do uh, some like uh, like a normal family life, family evening, and um, Oleg was a very exact type. If he said that he would be there uh, at six o'clock in the evening, he would be there at six o'clock in the evening. Like, you didn't have to doubt it. At least with me, he never uh, he never let me down. I was extremely worried. When uh, he didn't turn up for this special occasion that he planned, I went, you know, uh, outside. I looked at the windows in his apartment, and the lights were not lit. But, you know, I couldn't, there were no mobile phones at that time. So I went back home and I. In the morning, I uh, w went to uh, to work at the army, at the Magroka zone, and this is where I'm being I'm being told by uh, by my commander, Colonel Majors. They turned. There were several, but this one was <laughs> the last one. Was Colonel Majors? He said to me, "Your husband has disappeared, and we were we are worried. We, the American, are worried that he was kidnapped." by the Russians, so will you please, with the security, uh, uh, radio security, go and help check on the apartment. We have the key to the apartment. So I did, and when we, uh, <laughs> when the, it was the next day when we came to the apartment, I went 
I, I looked at the table, at the dining table, and there was a book laying there opened with uh, on a specific page. It's uh, It wouldn't occur to anybody uh, from outside, but to me it was clear. It was a signal that we agreed with Olegon that if he would be gone forever, he would leave this list, leave uh, this signal with the book opened on on the page. It said, uh, "What did you do?" Od Odyssey, traveler, traveler, Odyssey in Russian. What did you, What did you do? And the answer is, uh, I worked. So when I saw this, I knew that he was gone, but I couldn't say to the Americans to where and and why. So I just pretended that I'm just as surprised as they are. Did the Americans search his apartment for clues and find any uh, incriminating uh, stuff at that point? Yeah, uh, I mentioned it in some interviews, so I'm not going to, to, to take away the pleasure from you. Um, uh, Oleg, I don't know for what reason. Late, uh, we, we knew that he had two days to, to pack, to go, like more than 24 hours. He had enough time, but for some reason he didn't destroy any of his... Um, uh, of his gadgets in the apartment. And uh, later, when I asked uh, uh, the American investigators to give me back the radio that obviously they knew already that was used and the other gadgets to give me back the gadgets because the radio could be used. It was an expensive uh, Grundig uh, without the attach attachments. I didn't back ask back the attachments, but the Grundig I could use. But... They never gave me back it. They kept it as artifacts. But there were also other things like his deciphering blocks and on, on special paper, tiny things that I destroyed when we entered the apartment. And what I couldn't destroy then, then I carried on my body. I carried out. Because the intelligence officer, the, the, Ameri the, uh, the, the American security man, as intelligent as he was, he <laughs> listened to me when I said to him, you go to, to the sleeping room and search there and I will search in the living room. <laughs> so you sent him in the wrong direction and then you... Uh... Yes. yes, he was so, yeah, he was, I think, so grateful to me that I agreed to help. But he couldn't. <laughs> no. Why did Oleg leave at that time? Did he get a message from the KGB that his identity was going to be revealed? Yes, there was uh, something like uh, in Greece, uh, a colonel that knew about Oleg's work and knew his name uh, is uh, defected. A colonel. <coughs> His name. Gunderev. 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 Absolutely. And um, when I talked in Moscow to uh, to Mr. Nichiparenko, who Alex mentions in his memoirs to the leading officer, he said it was only a matter of time. We couldn't risk. We couldn't risk uh, or like uh, uh, staying there because he, had he not. Given away, I mean, Gunderev, Oleg's name, in the first weeks, it was only to put up the price. He was only, like, giving away information, uh, portion by portion, to get his stakes up. So we couldn't risk it. So it was decided to take Oleg back to Moscow. What was the immediate reaction at Radio Liberty and Radio Free Europe to the revelation that Oleg was a KGB agent? You see, there were two kind of people at the radio. The, 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 uh, the one half were always certain uh, that Oleg was working for Moscow, the new emigres. Half of them were always certain. They didn't like him. So they were triumph. A triumph. It was a triumph because now they could only say that they were they were always right. 
So, so the other half, it's the Russian emigres, the old emigres who were in different situations since they lived in the West. Uh, they felt more loyal. Whatever happened to uh, to a person, to one of them, but in the first place, he's a uh, he's like next of uh, uh, not, not next of kin, but he's a Russian. So they were more loyal. So those people, I ask them, I ask them to go to church with me and to pray for Oleg's safety. I was putting on a show, but it looked uh, authentic. I, I suspect, I knew that he was only, he could be only gone uh, to Russia, but I suspected, like, I didn't know, and let's pray for his safety. I put on a show. I was waiting for some kind of uh, uh, sign from Moscow to give me what I should do, and I tried just to keep mom, to keep calm. What was the impact on you and your daughter when it was discovered that Oleg had actually gone back to the Soviet Union? The impact was uh, that uh, when uh, about in February, you know, about two months later, um, the Russian foreign office announced that there will be a press conference in Moscow with him taking part, which actually officially made it official that he's in Moscow because there was a phone call before that uh, he's there, but it was not confirmed. But this press conference in Moscow made it more official. I was invited to the radio because there was a big screen and uh, 100 people were sitting in front of it uh, waiting for the press conference. And I was among them. I still played my innocence. But I already knew that... uh, According to my recruitment data at the, at the American Army, you know, the forms that I had to fill out, one of the main, main points was uh, that I wouldn't have uh, uh, living relatives in, in the Soviet Union, Moscow. And all that, even with divorce, uh, he would still be father to our daughter, which made him next weekend. So I knew for sure that I will lose my job. And my even before all the troubles started, um, I felt uh, very insecure because I knew that I would lose my job. I, well, I, he lost his job. I mean, Oleg. So he couldn't, like, we had a joint account. So nothing would be coming into that account, bank account from his side so basically it was a uh, it was a tragedy that coming i was uh, like uh, coming towards me but i somehow i felt because be, before all the trouble started i felt that maybe the russians will get in touch and tell me what to do and maybe there will be some solution but they didn't nothing i tried to go to several clandestine meetings in austria like nothing, gone. So I felt <laughs> like a big girl with a baby in a strange city. So the KGB abandoned you? Absolutely. At that point, yes. Well, this is obvious because uh, it was uh, um, later understood. I mean, they, uh, they were worried that I would be observed. Uh, by the Americans once Oleg turned out in Moscow. And this this could make uh, our meeting, our clandestine meeting, very unsafe, very insecure. It was a high security risk. So, of course, they had to, at least for, for, for a while, they had to break off. After this press conference, Actually, I packed my things into the car. I had a Honda, a little car, Honda. I packed my things into the car. And I took Alex. She was four. And, you know, uh, whatever belongings that, that would fit. And I still had a dog. I had a Barzoi dog. And with all this <laughs> company, I drove to Bonn. 
and under the cover of the night, I uh, they let me in into the Russian embassy grounds in Bonn. It was still Germany was not united, so in Bonn there was a rep- Russian representation, Russian um, embassy. Yes, and consulate and embassy. So they surprisingly they let me in once I said who I was, and I spent two days uh, and two nights at the embassy. And the ambassador said that he will evacuate me personally under a diplomatic uh, passport on Sunday. But what he didn't tell me that uh, he, uh, that he sent a Depeche, uh, he sent a telex to Moscow to get this approved. And can you, uh, his face, I mean, I felt terrible when I was in this um, on the embassy grounds because it was part of the Soviet Union. Soviet people lived there. In, it was their way of life. And this is something I didn't experience for, for the last uh, 20 years. I lived in the West. So I started feeling that I am... I am in the Soviet Union, but in a way I welcomed it because I felt this would be safer than staying in Munich. So imagine uh, uh, the ambassador's face uh, uh, where, uh, uh, it, when he received the telex back. He came over to me and he said, please believe me, I tried to do my best, but um, uh, I received an, an an answer from Moscow that you are not running a security risk because he will send you divorce papers from Moscow and because um, uh, Moscow is asking you to stay in place and try to keep your job. You know, there is a word in, 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 in German, Arschloch. It's like, it's uh, the back of your yeah, yeah. back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I couldn't, you know, they, uh, under, they were telling me, try to keep your job. Uh, and there, are, there is no arrest order. I remember these words, you know, word by word. So exactly like I drove with this little Honda under the cover of the night, I left the embassy. And I went back to Munich. And... and the Americans started their work on me, uh, like a secret interrogation. All my friends spied on me, which I learned uh, learned out later. I was asked not to come to work anymore. I was still, I guess, I still received my salary, but I didn't go to to Kazan. Because they couldn't, under the civil law, uh, they couldn't just uh, get rid of me just like that the next day without proving that I was a uh, uh, security risk. So they asked me to pass another lie detector, which I refused because I already felt that I saw that they were very hostile towards me, understandingly. So obviously I knew that even if I passed, they will say that I didn't. So I... I let the uh, the law work, like uh, take uh, take your time to get rid of me by law. So uh, what later helped me during uh, the uh, the hearings the, in court, the trial where I was uh, accused of spying for a non-NATO ally. <laughs> it's actually not for Soviet Union. The, the Americans were doing clandestinely without the, the Germans investigators. I guess because uh, they couldn't uh, um, agree. The Germans felt that I am a victim of circumstances because there was nothing, you know, no links, uh, no uh, data or uh, no material linking me to uh, being <laughs> a, a Russian agent. So the Germans uh, j- just didn't want to be under pressure, I guess, and they refused to cooperate. So um, the, the Americans continued the investigation, the clandestine, like um, all my the territory around my house in, in, in Munich, like the phone booths and uh, the 
bus stations, they were all covered by some ki- some kind of tapes that really were like, uh, how, how do you say, like... Uh, well, they bugged, they had them bugged. They, they bugged, they bugged. They bugged the whole area. And Germans felt, later they explained to me, that they felt, you know, it's terrible that 40 years after the war, um, they're being bugged, the whole... Uh, Several of those streets are being bugged by Americans and not like uh, without them knowing it. They felt annoyed. And this is what helped me. I psychologically, I, I felt this weakness. And of course, I, uh, I was uh, searching for my way out of, um, of this trial. And the only thing that uh, could be proven to me uh, is that, uh, you know, Several uh, months, I guess, in May, after in May 1986, after the press conference in Moscow, I received a phone call uh, on my stationery, on the normal phone. There were no mobiles, still uh, a phone fr- uh, from in Russian, which I Im- immediately understood that those were, you know, guys from Moscow. But this time they said not. Not Austria, come to Berlin, let's meet in Berlin. So I was sure that uh, we were going to meet in West Berlin when I came to Friedrichstrasse. And to my very big surprise, I found out uh, uh, that I was led through the clandestine doors into the GDR. And this happened two or three times. Uh, The Russians were investigating on what was happening in Munich, after Oleg's escape, they already knew that I I'm not at the Kazern, so there were not not so many talks about uh, about uh, my work, but more about the situation at the radio and in, in general. And what and, and and I repeated, I said what I knew, but I repeated again that I would be uh, arrested. Three men, uh, three Russian officers, they said that they really don't know what to do with me because it was just on the verge of perestroika. But still, I remember exactly like one of them said, what do you want us want us to do? You want to go back to Moscow and somewhere in, 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 in a remote uh, um, a remote uh, uh, suburb of Moscow, uh, you will be wearing uh, those uh, woolen stockings in the winter <laughs> and teaching uh, children English at school. Is this what you want? I said, yes, uh, n- not exactly, but what, what, what is the alternative? And they said that the alternative would probably be uh, if they uh, looked for, for a place for me somewhere in uh, the Soviet uh, uh, the Warsaw, Warsaw, Warsaw State uh, satellites, like uh, maybe in Czechoslovakia or in Poland, where life was a little bit better than in, in the Soviet Union. And this is what we, we agreed, that they will think about it. Now, I'm going to give you a little tip. Uh, can you uh, just uh, um, 1986, May to August, 1986, who was uh, working at the KGB headquarters in Dresden, Karlsruhe in Dresden? Uh, A certain Vladimir Putin. Absolutely. I remember one morning when the the two of them came back and they said, uh, and, and they said, we are sorry, but he couldn't come, you know, the third one, the colleague couldn't come because he's... uh, uh, wife uh, gave birth to a daughter. Well, at that time, of course, okay, one of the guys had a kid. But later, when I was in in Russia, in in and the, he became, you know, president. And I saw on TV. I saw this face. I started asking myself, where did I see the guys? So you you met Vladimir Putin at that point. When I asked my my, uh, I I have uh, um, I have uh, uh, I meet uh, uh, SVR, no, not KGB, right? It's K- SVR uh, veterans and colleagues uh, uh, in, in Moscow. So I I asked the, the guy who 
uh, was uh, inspiring me in Russian to publish Oleg's memoirs, which were not published in Russian. So this guy who writes, writes the pre-word for the book, I asked him, am I right in my thoughts? This is him. I mean, this... The, he, he, of course, but he says he was a very little, very little um, responsibility at that time. So if you get asked or if you talk about it, don't mention it, but just, yes, you can confirm that it was him. Little did you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you see, uh, when I uh, when I had problems here in Russia and I became almost homeless, I was working. Uh, living in the street, I would say, for several years. So at one point, just not to, to, uh, to, uh, to punish myself, I said, I will write the letter to the president. I still didn't know, it was before the memoirs, so I still didn't know it was him. I just said, I will write to the president and I will put down my case. I, I will ask for a place to live. <laughs> and then I remember one day, uh, it was many years later, supposed, supposedly uh, they couldn't find me uh, under my internet ad address and they didn't have my phone. But many la years later, I got a phone call and a, uh, and a person said, please, will you be ready to come to the administrative office of SVR in, in the center at Kuznetsky Mosque? That's where receptions take place. It's not the building outside Moscow. Will you please come? We have to speak to you about your request. Um, when I came there, and they said they will give me an apartment in in, in Moscow, I I didn't really believe it. Some other blah blah. And then they looked at the, at the hesitation at my face and they said, uh, uh, don't worry, it's us who have to rush because we have the orders from, from the first man to do it quickly. Don't tell anybody that it's us, but I do. And now we all know. It doesn't really help me much uh, in other ways, but... I must admit that uh, having a roof over the head in Moscow is uh, uh, one of the major problems being solved. Everything else is not that difficult. Then. Now, in 1987, you're arrested by West German police and put on trial. Can you tell me how that goes? Yeah. What happens? The, the Americans, they are very, very upset that the Germans let me go. And even there were made there were, uh, uh, 11 witnesses at the, at the hearings and none of them uh, were accepted by the court. So basically 11 against one plus one plus one was the German uh, officer uh, who was investigating my case. His name was Mike. Well, he, he, he said that uh, she didn't know anything. I felt uh, sorry that I admitted that I went to GDR because I crossed the border illegally. This was the only thing that uh, I admitted. I said I went there because I wanted to find, find out the uh, destiny of my husband. Of course, there the Russians asked me about the, the Americans and the army, but I didn't work there anymore, so I couldn't help them. So this was basically my line of defense. So later, I even felt sorry that I admitted that I was in the GDR. So as a result of the trial, you served some time in prison? Six months, because the Americans kept coming back to the Germans and saying, we will bring material, we know, we will bring. And they found, they, they already uh, sensed, sensed that nothing will happen at the court. So the only thing they could do to me, it's the utmost uh, uh, um, uh, period of time, six months, that they can uh, insist on keeping me under investigation. This, this was the only punishment that they, they could serve me. This is why it was six months, because the investigation was finished after four weeks. And the Germans tried to make my stay at the uh, women's interrogation prison in Munich as comfortable as possible. 
they would even take me out to meals and, and, and stuff and to meet my daughter. So they knew we just have to wait till the hearing. But uh, the, the Americans were quite aggressive after I was let out. So um, I had also on my probation, I could not go anywhere close German, uh, American for my own security and safety. I wanted to pick up my stuff at the base. They said, no, we will pick it up for you. It, it was very, very, uh, uh, you know, a very uncomfortable situation and dangerous situation, I would say, dangerous uh, to life. But slowly, uh, the Germans maneuvered me out, uh, out of the situation. And two years later, the Americans even apologized to me because they realized, I guess, that had another person been in my place, you know, it's only time can show and prove this, what an agent does. But uh, probably they, they slowly started realizing that had another person been in my place at that time, there would have been much more harm done to them. You see, it was, uh, I mentioned this, when I talked to the Russians about the, the persons that would come to, the Americans who, that would, would come to work in, 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 in Russia, I, I always avoided this way of trying to blackmail people. I always try to find a way, to, you know, to make somehow, if not friends, but to, like to, uh, tolerate each other. And uh, some years later, when, you know, already later in Moscow, uh, Nichiparenko said to me, which was the biggest compliment at all that I could ever hear in my life. He said, do you know what, you know, Nichiparenko is the leading officer in Moscow. He's a former leading officer. He said, do you think we didn't see in Russia what you tried to, to do? You tried to make peace between all, everybody. So... Um, <laughs> The Germans slowly maneuvered me out of this uh, very unpleasant uh, situation with the American intelligence. And I must say that the CIA, we had CIA people at Lake Liberty. They are not living anymore, but they knew me and I knew them. So they were, you know, CIA is always better than, uh, than the military intelligence because there are intelligence officers on both sides. So it's basically, you have to be polite to the enemy's, uh, enemy's agents, because yours can be in the same situation, uh, you know, uh, later, or, you know. So, uh, but the military, they are more like, uh, more straight-headed. Uh, no, you know, must be punished. So slowly the Germans have helped me maneuver out of this dangerous situation, live, live dangerous situation with the Americans. Uh, uh, there are many things that I know about American that I never told to anybody. And the Germans asked me you know, for my own safety to be careful with this knowledge. Uh, it's not, uh, it's not, doesn't have directly to do anything with the intelligence, but just the way the American run their business. So, um, uh, slowly, I'm, I maneuvered out of this danger, and even I was given a, a visa, a tourist visa, and I was three times in the United States, where I'm, I'm always under surveillance, and people, like my, I have family in the United States, they get a little bit scared, because they notice it, and, and the FBI comes to them and says, well, what, what, what did she ask you? What does she want? So it's an unpleasant uh, situation. But I have great family <coughs> in the United States. It's the son of this, uh, uh, my uncle in London. He lives in the United States. Am I correct that at one point you shared a cell with somebody from the Red Army faction? Uh, you have, uh, I, I don't think that I wrote about it, I mentioned it to people, but you have very good infos. Um, I, w I didn't share the cell, but um, I was, uh, our cells were next to each other. And uh, what, what was the name of the girl? I forget. Uh, the Red Army people initiates uh, several explosions out of you know political reasons in, in, in Germany. 
I asked, I uh, not Helen. What was her name? I asked her, can you please tell me why? Why do you always use the same device? It's uh, it's easy to figure out. Why do you always use the same device? Why don't you? And she look, looked. She she, she was she, she was extremely. Uh, this woman. She was extremely composed very strong in her beliefs. Uh, from what I know later, she was released from prison and she became a teacher somewhere she was pardoned. Can you tell me much about your five years on parole? This was more to really to protect me. On parole meant that every time uh, if a Russian officer would uh, get in touch with me, intelligence officer, would get in touch with me, I would report that to the Germans. And I was given a man to look after me. He became a great friend. Late, unfortunately, he died uh, 10 years later. So I, I, it was very hard for me because I didn't have m- much that would um, keep me in, in Germany, like uh, connections and people were going away and dying and the radio was being closed and Everything was being dismantled. So I really didn't fit into this new life 10 years later. I found another path. I did something else. I must tell you a story about John Wood. There are always John Wood. Am I, am I five people? Am I six people? Always in Moscow, there are John Wood. Everywhere, there are John Wood. So John Wood from England called me and he said that we know who you are. We know who you are. So uh, tell, go tomorrow to the embassy and say that if the Russians, it was 1988, and the Russians were just getting their embassy and consulate in Munich. So John tells me, go to the, uh, go to the embassy and tell them if they do this and this politically, we will stop uh, all their, uh, all the payments, the SWIFT, we will block the SWIFT for 24 hours. So I run to the embassy. I, I speak to, <laughs> to to the second uh, uh, deputy, and I, I, who is the KGB man, and I tell him John Wood from London. You know, he told me this, and this actually happens. Then John Wood said that he would love to have uh, to, to to he would love to invite me to London. I was in London on his invitation several times. We spent a great time. Yeah, and then uh, somehow life took me to, to Moscow. Don't miss the episode extras such as videos, photos and other content. Just look for the link in the podcast information. The podcast wouldn't exist without the generous support of our financial supporters and I'd like to thank one and all of them for keeping the podcast on the road if you'd like to help the project just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate the cold war conversation continues in our facebook discussion group just search for cold war conversations in facebook thanks very much for listening and see you next week